Great, thank you so much. Thanks to everybody who's joining today. Um, we will go ahead and get started shortly. And yeah, Lori introduced herself in the chat box. Lori Baker, Dr. Lori Baker is my co-pilot today and she's gonna be helping manage uh, questions from the chat box and sort of help us along the way. Um, and then we do have a link to the slides for today that we'll drop in the chat box as well as the cloud project. Um, so let me drop that in there. Give me one second. I now got it now. Okay, that's our Studio Cloud, perfect. And then I'm gonna drop those link to the slides as well. Okay, let's try that. And then please indicate in the chat box if you're having a hard time accessing either one of those. Oh, I see a message there from Emma as well about being super excited. I'm super excited to teach you about sharing it. So it's great. Okay, I'm not seeing any issues in the chat box. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get started if that's okay with everyone. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Let's do... This one. Okay, and then could I get confirmation, Lori, that you can see my screen? Yep, looks good. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, let me go full screen. And oh, so screen sharing has stopped as a shared window is closed. Okay, let me try this again. Try sharing my desktop instead. Okay. How's that looking? Is that looking okay? Full screen? Yeah, that looks great. Okay, sounds good. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So, welcome everyone to sharing your work with Sharingen. And this is an introductory workshop on how to use the Sharingen package to create presentations. And it's a two-part workshop. So today we're gonna to go over part one, which is the basics. And then on Thursday, we'll go over part two, which is the beyond. And so the basics today is gonna to cover um, what is Sharingen, how to use it, the, the main different components, and there'll be an interactive piece with the RStudio Cloud that we'll get into. And, um, and then at the end of it, if we have time, we're gonna also deploy our slides to GitHub so that you can figure out how, how to do that so that you can get a link that then you can share with whoever you want. So the idea is for you to get um, sort of from start to finish, like creating a slide deck and then ultimately deploying it on the web so that you can share it. Um, and then on Thursday, we'll go through more advanced topics, um, mostly relating to CSS, and slide customization, whoops, jumped ahead there. And, um, and then using a different package to add some, some cool functionality to the slides. Okay, so with that, um, a little bit about me. So my name is Sylvia Canelon and I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Pennsylvania, which is located in Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania in the States. And I've got my contact info there at the bottom. And I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, I am also recently a certified Tidyverse instructor uh, with our studio, which will come up a little bit today, just in terms of like how the workshop is structured. Okay, and then I'll, I'd like to thank uh, a few people and some groups for their help today. So we'll start with Lori Baker and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi everyone, um, so my name is Lori Baker. I'm a data science lecturer at the Office for National Statistics. Um, and I met Sylvia actually when we did our, our studio instructor training together. So I'm really, really pleased to be here and I'll be monitoring the chat. So if you have any trouble sort of setting up our studio cloud or at any point during the workshop, 
then just um, just send me either a personal or a message to the group. Um, and I'm looking forward to today's session. Thanks, Sylvia. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And I forgot to mention earlier that the way the workshop is going to be structured is there's going to be a break after 50 minutes. Um, so I should have started my timer a few minutes ago, but I'm going to start it now. And after 50 minutes, um, we'll take a break regardless of where we are in the content and we'll take a 10 minute break um, where you can stretch, go to the bathroom, grab a snack or whatever you want. So let me get that started. I'm going to go ahead and say 45 minutes because we've already been chatting. Okay. Who's next? Let's see. Okay, so the next um, round of acknowledgements I want to make is to the NHSR community who's let me uh, host this workshop today. So thank you to them. And also specifically, there's a couple of packages that we'll get to um, near the end of the workshop today that I'll highlight. So one of them is an NHSR theme package developed by Tom Demet. And this is a package that um, is in development to create templates that the NHSR community can use for presenting a variety of different um, outputs and all of them are align, aligned with the NHS um, identity guidelines, which are quite strict. Um, and, and there's a package or there's a theme developed um, for this workshop specifically that I put together and we'll be able to see that later, but that follows the same guidelines as well. And then the other package is an NHSR data sets uh, package developed by Chris Maney and that's a data set. Uh, yeah, it's just a data set package contains, I think, three different data sets that people can use to practice their R skills with. And so we'll see an example of that as well. And then, uh, of course, I want to thank um, Yihua Xie for having developed this sharing in package and also Garrigay and Bui who developed sharing an extra package, which was used uh, in development of the slides today and is also a big part of the workshop on Thursday. And then overall, um, I'd like to acknowledge Allison Hill, who's a professional uh, data or professional educator and data scientist at our studio, who develops a lot of really amazing educational content, uh, a lot of which has been used to inform the workshop uh, today and Thursday. Okay, so a little bit about you. You're somebody who knows Markdown, and you also know R Markdown. And you want to know about how to make cool HTML slides. That's why you're here. Um, my mouse keeps moving. Okay, so how do we make cool HTML slides? It takes a team. There's a lot of different components. So the first part is there is Remark JS, JS standing for JavaScript. Um, and it works together, JavaScript works together with Markdown to create a simple in browser Markdown driven slideshow tool. Um, and this is a definition from Remark, which also adds that it's targeted at people who know their way around HTML and CSS. Um, I think that the sharing in package does a really nice job at taking out some of those, some of the need to know uh, HTML and CSS, which is really wonderful. And of course, we'll cover CSS on Thursday. Um, but what I want you to take away is that Remark is, is a tool that allows you to create simple slideshows that can be used um, in a browser. And then we've got, of course, a sharing in package. And it's a package that essentially introduces Remark JavaScript to our Markdown. Because as I mentioned before, Remark uh, works with Markdown, but it doesn't it's not familiar with R Markdown. And so Schengen introduces the two so that they can work together. And then, and then we've got the CSS component as well. So CSS stands for cascading style sheet and it turns what I consider functional but dull HTML content. So an example would be what's on the left um, into HTML content with style on the right. And so you can see that the, the headings look different, the fonts look different, the colors look different. Um, so that's just one simple example of, of the difference that it can make. Okay, and then a note again about the, the theme that I described earlier. So the theme involved uh, creating uh, CSS style sheets. And so the CSS created for the NHSR community, as I mentioned, follows the NHS identity guidelines and is included in the NHSR theme package. 
And an example is there on the left-hand side of what that looks like. So you'll notice, and we'll get to this later as well, but you'll notice there's a, there's a logo and then there's a title and, um, and the colors align with the NHS guidelines. Okay, so getting started, the first step is to install the NHSR theme from, uh, from GitHub. So there's a step there. And then that should be step number two. Um, step number two should be to load the package. And then after that, we would create a new file, a new R Markdown file, and then use the template that's installed by the NHSR theme package. And then you'd give your slide deck a name, and we'll go through these steps shortly. Not that shortly. Okay. Directory. So the next piece is the um, that once you create this R Markdown file, there's a directory that's created alongside of it. And so it, cre it creates a couple different folders along with the R Markdown file itself. So there's an R Markdown file, and in the example here, I just called it my slides. And then you'll also see an IMG or image folder that contains logo files uh, that come preloaded with this theme from the package. And then you'll also see the CSS folder, which contains the custom um, CSS theme files. And there's also an HTML file in there um, that takes care of adding the NHS logo to each of the slides and you don't have to worry about that. But it's in there, so I wanna make sure that you know. Okay, so when we make this new R Markdown file, it's gonna look similar to R Markdown files that you might've created in the past, but there are uh, a few big differences. So this is sort of the top half of the YAML and what it's gonna look like. And so you'll see some of the things are familiar, like the title, subtitle, author, date, and so on. And then here, um, I should say, where it says output, you might be used to seeing output colon HTML underscore document, for example. And so that, that is different here. So we have a new kind of output and the output for this, this slide, uh, the slide deck is sharing in and then Moon Reader. And then we have within the sharing in Moon Reader, we have also CSS properties that we can specify. So we let sharing in know where to find the styling sheets. So there's, there's some default, there's a default sheet that is always loaded that comes with um, different CSS um, definitions that help create the sort of basic functionality of sharing in. And then, and so that's the default one. And then the other two are the, the ones designed specifically for the NHSR group. And then the bottom half of the YAML, which still falls under the sharing in Moon Reader um, portion, is you'll also see there's a directory that's created for libraries. And then there's a seal colon false. And so when it's false, it just means that you get to create your own custom title slide. If you, if you have it set to true, then it kind of creates a title slide for you using metadata from your YAML. And then there's this nature section, which talks about a few different things. So you'll see highlight style, highlight lines, and highlight language. And so highlight style um, indicates the style that you would use to highlight syntax for code. And then, um, if you have highlight lines enabled then or set to true, then it enables code line highlighting. You can specify languages that you'd like to highlight within your document. Um, and then a couple of these other ones are a little more straightforward. So whether or not you wanna count incremental slides, which we'll get into, and then what, um, what size or aspect ratio do you want your slides to take on? So the default is set to, is set to widescreen, but you can also change that to four, uh, to four three if you like. And then I had mentioned before that there's this HTML file in the, H in the CSS folder that we don't need to worry about. This portion deals with that and like incorporates that into um, the document. And then there's some extra info on, on this slide, which talks a little bit more about that seal option, but also links to different highlight style options and lists them below so that you can try them out um, on your own later on. Okay, so let's try it live together. And so for this, I'm going to switch to the RStudio Cloud and then we can all go through the steps of, uh, let's see, how do I wanna do this? Okay, there we go. We can all go through the steps of creating the template and seeing what it looks like. 
Okay, so let me actually go back to the chat box so I can get that link. It's a little more direct. Okay, so that's the same page. Um, okay, so let me figure out where our workshop is in here. It should be called Sharingan Basics and Beyond. It's probably at the very bottom. Is there a way to filter? Check. If you scroll up right to the top, there's mm -hmm. a box to do a search. And if you just put in the jarring bit, then it should find it. But it's because it's we've got everybody's project. So it's building up and up and up and up. So it's going to get longer and longer and longer. So if you go keep going up to the top, keep going. Oh, more? So it's low on my screen. A bit uh, further up. I don't think I can scroll further up. There, just underneath new project. If yeah, you yeah. tap okay. in there, you'll see a few. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Mm. So then how would I then also, I mean, I, could, I guess I can just probably click it, right? You probably got to up someone's. Oh, yeah. yeah. It doesn't look right. If you go to the one that um, says this Chris Lee created, it's, yeah. You'll just come down a bit, it will tell you which one is it. Um, uh, yeah, I'm in it as well. Yeah, but this one, uh, yeah. It should open up a new project for you. I'm in one, but I've got admin rights, so I think I'm actually in the original, so I'm not going to do anything with it because <laughs> okay. I might change it. Okay, okay, okay. We're yeah, it's just reconnecting for me. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I guess we can do a little. Oh. Window. I think that's my fault because I'm got the admin rights. So I think we keep pushing each other out. So I'm going to leave it alone. And you take it. Sorry. Okay. okay. No, it's okay. It's totally the fine. technical hitches. <laughs> okay. So we've got um, the project open now. And let's just do a quick little tour about what's what in here. So if you um, see where I'm at on the right hand side, let me close this so it's not cluttering up things. Let me make this a little bit bigger, a lot bigger. Okay, so on the right-hand side, you'll see um, the files tab in the lower right pane. And then if you click on project, then that's where we should be starting from. That's where our project file is. And so you'll see that I already created um, the my slides when I was testing this earlier, so we can ignore that. And I'm just gonna go ahead and close this. And, that up. Okay, and so what we're going to do is go through the steps of creating a new template or a new file. And so we're going to say file, new file, our markdown. Gosh, the zoom thing is getting in the way. Uh, let me move that. Okay, and then we're going to say from template. And then you'll see the NHSR presentation template listed here, and you'll see that it belongs to the NHSR theme. And then we'll just name our slides. So I'm going to say my other slides. And that's going to get saved to that project spot that we're looking at. Okay, so there we go. And I had described in my slides a little bit ago that there's a few different folders along with the file that gets created. So you can see those here. There's that libraries folder that we don't need to worry about. There's image folder that's got um, a few different logos on there that you can use. And then there's also the CSS. Whoops, that's the one I was just in. There's also the, oh no, I wasn't in that one. I was an image. There's a CSS folder that has the different CSS files and then the insert logo file. We don't need to worry about either. Um, and then of course there's the R markdown file, which is showing up here on the left. So we have the YAML that we just went over and all the different pieces to it. It's kind of a long YAML. 
And I think this is where this portion of the workshop stops. So if everyone has their, if everyone's able to get to the step, we'll try, let's try doing the participants green checkbox. I know we didn't talk about that earlier, but there's an option on, there should be an option in your Zoom window to click participants and then you can find your name in the list. And then if you could click the green checkbox or green circle with the check in it that says yes, um, when you get to the step, then that would be great. And I, I will wait. In the meantime, I'll go back to my slides here. Oh, I see Lori put in the steps to making a new file. Thanks, Lori. That's really helpful. Um, actually, I, I'm having a hard time seeing all the Zoom things. Oh, here we go. Participants. Okay, so folks don't seem to be using the participants checkbox thing, but yeah, smiley faces are great. Smiley faces if you're able to uh, create a new, a new file. Okay, great. I've got a few there. Yeah, that's all right, Kate. Don't worry about the checkbox. It might be a Zoom, uh, a Zoom version thing, so don't worry about it. If you are able to make a new file with the template, then go ahead and just put a little smiley face in the chat box. Okay, it seems like people are able to do that. Okay, so no errors there. Okay, great. Then let's go ahead and move on to the next step. Close all my, I've got so many little Zoom boxes and they're all cluttering up my slides. Uh, okay. All right, so let's talk about the first few slides. So if you come back to the, uh, the slides that I'm sharing, um, you will see and if you want to look at your, the slides that you just created or the file that you just created, you can do that, but we'll, we'll go through it piece by piece. So the first few slides that are already loaded in there, um, some things to know, something that's really important that's kind of hard to remember sometimes is that the slide content starts immediately after the YAML. So the YAML, uh, if you remember, it has, it kind of starts with three dashes and ends with three dashes. And then right under the YAML is where the content of the slides um, begins. And so, as I mentioned, then, and as you saw, the, the package that we use and the template comes preloaded with a few things. So one of the things that you probably noticed is that right under the YAML, there's a setup chunk, um, which doesn't get put into the slides because I think echo is set to false for that chunk. So you won't see it in showing up in your slides, but that is the first thing in there. And that has a few different libraries and some chunk options that are set for the whole slide deck. And then you'll also see underneath that some example slides that are included with the template that are separated by three dashes. So you'll see a title slide that has the title slide class. You'll, and, and you'll also notice that content is aligned with the left and the bottom of the slide. So those are also classes. So it will say class and then it'll say title slide left and bottom. And then you'll also see after that an inverse slide using the inverse slide class and you'll also see that this content is aligned with the middle and the center and then you'll see incremental slides after that that don't have any specified slide class and so it just starts right away with the with the header the heading and and the incremental steps are made using two dashes and using um, bullet points that are made using markdown the incremental slides are made with the two dashes, but you can also make bullet points using Markdown, as well as other things. Let's see, let me open my windows again. Okay, so the next step that we'll do is we will view the slides that are generated by this new file. And so you have two options. One, you can run the Sharingan's, Sharingan's infinite moon reader function in the console to do this. And you can also access the feature using the IDE toolbar, which we'll look at. And the other option is to just knit the document. 
um, which will create like a separate window where you can view your slides. But I recommend option number one, which is to use Sherrington's infinite moon reader function. And the setup chunk looks like this. And so I mentioned it's got a few libraries that are already loaded and then some chunk options that are set for the whole slide deck. And then you'll also see a title slide that looks like this. And so it starts right away after the YAML. And so it doesn't need three dashes at the top because it starts right after the YAML. But this is what it should look like. And then we also have the inverse slide here and the incremental slides, which end up looking like this once we click through. And I think, yeah, I think at this point we can go ahead. And if you wanna go to your cloud project again and look through um, the slides by using that sharing in function, I'll show you how to do that next. So I'm in the console and I'm just gonna type in sharing in, and then I'm gonna start typing infinite moon reader. So I think you can use either one. So I'll just pick the top one. So it's inf underscore MR. And then you'll see on the right hand side that it generated a preview box, preview window in the viewer that lets you see the slides. And so you can, um, if you click inside that box and you can use your, your keyboard to um, use the arrows and move through it. So you can see this is the inverse slide, for example, and then you see um, the slide where the bullets start to appear and you can click through and you can see how the three bullet points are showing up incrementally. And if we go over here to our, our markdown file and scroll down, there's a setup chunk. There's the very first slide, which contains, which is the title slide and it contains information from the YAML. That's what this R markdown function with the metadata um, uses to create the title slide. And then there's the inverse slide. And then here is where the slide that has the incremental slides um, is created. And so we have the heading and then we have the two dashes and the two dashes indicate each kind of stopping point before the next piece. And that's how it shows up. And so in looking through this file, let me go back to my slides. What are some things that you noticed about the syntax? So in terms of the things that you can see in the markdown file, the R markdown file, what are some things, and if you wanna use a chat box to share, that'd be great. What would you say that you noticed um, that maybe looks familiar, like something that already is something you might've used um, in a different R markdown file in the past? We talked about markdown things. Yep, I see Emma shared pound sign or hashtag for titles. Yep, so that's part of markdown is having, being able to use um, that syntax. Anything else that looked familiar to anybody? Great, yep, Jonathan says set up chunk has, yeah, those back ticks and the R setup. Mm -hmm. So that looks familiar. So that's what a code chunk looks like and that's gonna look familiar from other R markdown files. Okay, so let's go through some of the other things. So as people have pointed out already, what looks familiar from markdown is probably headings and how they're structured. Bold and italic type are things that um, would be familiar from Markdown. And then these weren't necessarily included in these particular slides, but you'd also be able to include links and images using um, the format on this slide here with exclamation points, square brackets, and the parentheses. And then you can also add bullet points. So in our example, we had, um, I think we used the dashes, and this should actually be a, an asterisk. There should be an asterisk in this slide as well. But you can use dashes or pluses or asterisks to make um, to make slides, or to make bullet points. Excuse me. And then you can also make numbered lists, um, just using a number one and a and a period. But in terms of things that may not be so familiar, um, 
that are particular to Remark JS is that the first slide, you know, there's things about the slides themselves. So the first slide starts immediately after the YAML, so it doesn't need to begin with three dashes. But otherwise, slides are separated by three dashes. Incremental slides are separated by two dashes. And then another feature that's nice is you're able to add presenter notes to your slides as well using three question marks. And so the way you would do that is you would just type in, I guess I can just show you, you would type in with my windows. For example, let's add some presenter notes to our inverse slide. And you'll notice that when I moved my cursor and clicked to that part of my R Markdown file, the preview window on the right-hand side updated to where I'm at, which is very convenient. So let's say I wanted to add presenter notes here. I would type in three question marks and then follow up with, you know, this is an example of presenter notes. And then I'll save it. And then it'll render a new version of the slides. And so now I should be able to click back to my preview window and click the letter P on my keyboard, which switches us into presenter, presenter mode. And then you'll be able to see um, the slides on the left and then the notes on the right hand side along with the timer. And, and then if we click the letter P again, whoops, then you're back to the main view. And then I think, yeah, yeah. if you hit the letter H on your keyboard, then it brings up this help menu. So if you forget what's what, you can always check that out about the different options that Remark um, includes. And then you can hit H again to make it go away. So P for presenter view, toggle out, and then H to toggle out or toggle the help menu, and then H again to remove it. Okay, moving on. So here we have a transition slide. I really need to get rid of some of these little boxes. Uh, okay, so how can we make our slides look more interesting? Um, one of the downsides of having strict identity guidelines to follow is that you can't necessarily have a ton of fun with fonts or colors. But there are other ways to make your slides look more interesting. And so we're going to focus on that um, because I think it's important to be able to, you know, have a little bit of room to express yourself when you're making slides so that they don't all look the same despite using a template like the one that was designed for this workshop. So we can make our slides look more interesting with placement of the content on the slide, with pretty pictures, and with icons. So if we start with layouts, you can align an entire slide horizontally or vertically. And we talked about this a little bit earlier when we talked about that line underneath the three dashes when you start a new slide that says class. So we already saw an example of class inverse to indicate an inverse slide, but you can also um, use class to align the contents of the entire slide. And so there's different options listed there on the left-hand side. And so, for example, if you wanted a slide that had its content centered and also in the middle, then you would use class center middle. And an example of what that would look like is here. So this slide shows what the actual code would look like in the R Markdown file to generate this slide. And then you can also choose to align only some of the content. And so you would still be using uh, classes, but they look a little bit different. So instead of you aligning the whole slide with that class um, property at the top, you would use class properties within your content. And so that looks like the, these examples on the left-hand side of the slide. So you would have dot, and then you could say left, center, or right, and then put the text inside the square brackets and those things would get aligned um, specifically. So for example, if I wanted a slide um, that looked a lot like the one we just made in the last, or the one we just looked at in the last slide, we would still use center middle if we wanted it to be centered in the slide and also in the middle, but maybe we want to align some of the text one way and another part of the text another way. So we could use left and right for that. And what it would look like would be like this. So you would have 
the left um, class aligning this piece of the text here, and then the right class aligning the right hand piece of the text. And then there's also ways that you can pull, you can arrange content on the slide um, in kind of a, a larger way, I guess, or a more a broader way, which is you can either pull content to either side of the slide. So the pull left class pulls content to the left 47% of whatever container it's in, like the text indicated here and the hex sticker that I included below. And then pull right similarly pulls content to the right 47% of whatever container it's in. And I made a note here that you've most certainly already seen these content classes in action today in our slides. So I use them often. And these ones, um, when you use these particular classes, you, you don't, they don't have to take up the entire slide. You can choose to align, to pull some of the content, um, you know, near the, at some point in your slide, and then you could decide to not use them, like I did with this last sentence here. And then you go back to the standard of taking up the whole slide width. Um, so you can mix and match that way. Uh, you can also use some preset um, column layouts or one specific column layout that comes with the Sharingan package and Remark. Um, or specific to the Sharingan package, which is left column and right column. And so left column places content into a column that is 20% wide, not 20% width. And the text you'll notice is a little bit lighter. And then right column places content into a column that's 75% wide. And it also you can, you has a little bit of padding on the top. So you see that it's not flush with the left column, but a little bit below. And then unlike the pull content classes, these column classes are fixed for the entire slide. So you can't kind of mix and match very easily when you use the two column layout. They're meant to be used together. And I should point out, I'm noticing that the slides aren't showing the period before right column and left column. And I think the same might've happened with poll, but there, there definitely needs to be a period there um, for you to be able to use it. That's what indicates that you're using a, a class, a CSS class. Make sure to look into that. Okay, and then pictures. So there's a variety of ways to add images to your slides. So I've included a few here. So we talked about Markdown already and how you can use the exclamation point and the square brackets and the parentheses to add an image to your document. And the advantage is that it's really simple. It's easy to, easier to remember and you're probably already familiar with it, but it's not very flexible. Um, the output size really depends on the size of the image that you're, you're trying to pull in. Um, you can get around that by using a custom JavaScript function which if we have time to on Thursday, we might get to, um, but, but otherwise sort of out of the box, it's not easy to control the size of the, the image that you're bringing in. Now you can also use knitter. So uh, I've included here the knitter function include graphics. It's a really nice way to bring in images to your document as well. And so in this case, I'm bringing in um, an, an image from the image folder that I had on my local computer. Um, and I've indicated the file path here relative to where, wherever my project was. And so this is pretty flexible. Um, it can be a little bit bulky because it requires, um, you know, typing in the code to your document. So if you're using a code chunk, for example, that does take up a little bit of space. Um, so, you know, this sort of a personal preference sort of thing, but there are definitely chunk options that you can use to control the size of your output figures that way. And I've, and I've included a link there for more options that are specific to um, include graphics that you can look into. And then the another option is to just use straight up HTML in your slides because we are generating um, HTML slides when we generate slides with Sharingan. You can also just type in HTML code within your R Markdown file and that gets rendered as well. And so I've included here what I used to include the image on the right-hand side right here. So there's a the little image um, indicator there. And then there's a source that you would specify, which can be a file path or, um, or a link. 
And then you can also specify a bunch of other things. So in this example, I just specified the width to be 90% of, of its container. And then, um, you know, so I just noted here that this is the most flexible option. It's a little bit unsightly if you're not used to looking at HTML code. Um, it takes a little bit of time to get used to the syntax. So I've linked to some information there. And then I've included here um, an example of how you would include, insert like an avatar of yourself into your slides if you wanted to for like a little an introductory slide or a goodbye slide at the end, you would use um, something very similar. And this is what I, what I used in my introductory slide when I started the workshop. And then there's also, um, you can add images to your slides using the background background properties in your um, in your slide classes. So at the top where you would have class colon and then whatever, however you wanted to align your slides or whether you want it to be an inverse slide, you could also add more information to that segment, which you can kind of think about it like each slide has its own YAML. So like if you're looking at within a slide on your in your R Markdown document, you can kind of think about adding options this way, like you might add different YAML options to like a whole document, you can add more options to just your slide. And so background properties are, uh, are one kind of, uh, of information that you can add that way. So the background image property you can use just like classes. And so you would indicate the background image using background dash image colon and then URL and then between the parentheses you would include um, a link or you can include a file path. And then you'd also specify the size of that background and so there's a couple of options there you can use cover. Which rescales and crops the, the image without any empty space or you can use contain which just rescales it so that it fits within the slide. And then you can also move this image around by using background position. And I've included a link um, for how for other things you can look at to play around with it. Excuse me, this is what I use. Um, this is what's commonly used to add uh, logos or something like that to, or maybe like a hex sticker to a slide. You would use the background position to indicate, okay, I want it to be on the top right, for example, or you know, bottom left or wherever it is that you'd like to do it. So that's pretty, pretty common and you can do, I didn't include an example here, but you can add multiple background images um, using this format and you would just do that by including an additional URL and separating the two of them by a comma. So in this example, it would be, or let's look at the right hand side. So this is an example of an image from a URL. And so you would just type URL parentheses and then you'd include your link and then you do comma and then you would do another URL and then include your link or file path. And then similarly for the other properties like size and background position, you would just separate the, the, the specifications that you're making with a comma so that it knows that the kind of like arguments in a function. So it knows that the first set corresponds with the first photo and then the second set would correspond with the second photo. So, but this is easier to understand with examples. So let's look at background size and action in these next slides. So this is what that image looks like without anything specifying background size. This is a pretty large image. And then this is what it would look like if you specified cover for background size, which it covers the entire slide. And if you wanted to use contain, then it would uh, rescale it so that it fits within your slide. So you'll see some white space on the left and right because it's a little bit smaller than the area of the slide. Um, but if you were using the ratio four three, maybe instead of the standard one, instead of widescreen, then perhaps it would look it would look similar um, because it looks to be about that size or those proportions. Okay, and then the other part is icons, and I know Laura's excited about this because she likes the idea of using them, and I love using them, and I've been using them in this presentation. So one of the things you can do is include emojis. Um, Hadley's created this emoji package and that I've linked to. And so to insert the emoji on the left-hand side, which is a smile, then you would use um, the syntax highlighted here, but you wanna make sure to surround this by backticks. Now they weren't showing up 
there's a very specific way you have to type in something um, in an R markdown file if you want to show the back ticks, because um, otherwise it just gets rendered. So anyway, all that to say that remember to surround this with back ticks. You can also use Font Awesome, which is a really great collection of awesome icons. And uh, the example here on the left is a little brain. And so you can insert them by copying and pasting the HTML directly from the website, or you can use the icon package, which was developed uh, a few years ago and just works really well for, for some of the icons. I think there's some newer ones that don't show up with this package, but otherwise it works really, really well. And so, for example, you would write, um, you'd use icon package and then you'd use a function FA for font awesome. And then you would use, uh, you would specify which icon you were looking for. And just like we were talking about with images, using HTML gives you the most flexibility. And so you could add additional information to this example, if you wanted to position the icon in a certain place relative to your text, or if you wanted to make it bigger, you could indicate that in there as well. Um, so just a quick note about that. Another advantage, I guess, too, sometimes using HTML directly in your R markdown file. And there's also academicons. So I have the example there of um, ORCID ID. And the easiest way to access these and include them in your slides is to use the icon package um, because the icon package doesn't just have, doesn't just include icons from Font Awesome, but it includes icons from Academicons and from um, a different group that I'll go to next. And so you can also use it here. Um, yeah, so I think it's wrapped up in the same, wrapped up in the same function. So this one generated this, ORCID ID um, icon. And then the last one, which I don't use very often, but it is another option, is Ionicons. So they have a, a bit of a different style. They have a, a thinner line. Um, and I haven't had as much luck with these in combination with the icon package, but there are some that are in there. And so, for example, the one generated on the left of this little flask was generated by using the icon package and the II function. Um, so that's an option there as well. Okay, so now we're going to hit a point where we're going to do a your turn exercise and I'm going to give you 10 minutes to make your own about me slide for your slide deck. And so you might want to think about including details like your name and affiliation, your location or your contact info. And so I've included there some options that you can think about practicing while you're doing this exercise. So you might practice moving content around on the slide or separating that or adding an image or a photo maybe of yourself, um, linking to sites or social media, maybe adding some icons. And then at the end, I linked to my, uh, let me back up a little bit. All of these different options that you can consider or most of them link to slides where I've already talked about them. So if you click them, it'll take you to those slides in the slide deck. And, but the last option here specifically takes you to my about me slide in our slide deck today, if you wanted to look at it for ideas. And then, uh, and one last thing before we get started, if you do find yourself jumping around the slide deck using links and you get a little disoriented, you can use, you should be able to use the O key, which gives an overview of the slides. And well, this is a feature that we'll go over on Thursday. Um, but then you'll be able to just locate the slide that you're interested in and then find your way back. And then you can click the letter O on your keyboard again to, to hide it. Um, okay, so let me, actually, Lori, could you set a timer for 10 minutes since I've got a timer running for, oh, you know what? Let's, we can stop here. This is actually really nice because we're running out of time for the block um, anyway. And so we'll take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and do the your turn when everybody takes our break. So um, I'm gonna set, so I can set a new timer for 10 minutes for a break. So yeah, don't worry about looking at this exercise or starting it unless you really, really want to because we'll have another 10 minutes when we come back from break. But for now, 10 minutes start now and I will see you soon.
white face at your back end, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Okay, let's wait a little bit longer. Yeah, and as you're returning, if you could indicate in the chat box with a smiley face at your back, that'd be really helpful. Thank you. We can go ahead and keep going. Okay, sweet. Let me go back to sharing my screen. I think this was going to work last time. Okay. So let's, um, yeah, just sort of come back to where we had left off before, which was a your turn exercise where you're gonna practice creating an about me slide. Um, and again, there's links in this slide if you'd like to use them. And uh, I'll go ahead and set a timer. And feel free to drop questions in the chat box as they come up. So 10 minutes for the your turn starts now. Okay, so there's a question here about using Infinite Moon Reader. Um, okay, so let's go to our cloud project. So one of the things I forgot to mention was that when you run, when you run that function, you only need to do it once, and then it'll automatically show you a preview. And so that might be that might be part of what's going on, but could also be cloud project related. So let's take a look. Oh, what do you mean I don't have access? Try refreshing. Change this. I know one of the things that happens sometimes with cloud projects is that it bumps you off um, if you're idle for too long. And so refreshing your project page is always a good idea when, you're, when you've left it sitting for a little bit. Okay, let's check in. I want to check in again, Emma, with you and to see if you've been able to sort out. Okay, awesome. Thank you.
Okay, I see a question about how to add an image to our Cedar Cloud project. Good question. I don't think I've ever done that. So let's let's try and figure it out. I guess you would probably click upload in the bottom right. And then I think perhaps you want to navigate to your image folder. So like that. And then browse. So let me find, I'll pick one from, from my computer. Say what's in this one. No. This folder. I'll add in the photo that I had been using earlier. <clears throat> See if that shows up nicely. Okay, so that seemed to do it. Let me know if you have any issues and then um, and we can troubleshoot. Thank you. Good question. And we've got about four minutes left. So you've got some time still to play around. Actually, here's a question. Oh, here we go. How do you add the emojis where I put the code? Okay, sure. That'd be a great thing to demo because I don't think I included install package information in the slides for that. Uh, okay, so the first thing we'll need to do is install the package uh, from GitHub. And so you can use DevTools and then install GitHub. And then you would indicate the where the package is. And so I think it might be Hadley's email repo. Let's see. Yeah, I think that might work. Okay, another question while we wait for that is I'm trying to use left column and right column, but the text in the right hand column is slightly lower. Yes. Um, yep. So that's that padding that's automatically put in there, padding on the top. There is a way, let me update this real quick. Uh, okay, so there is a way to take that out. It involves digging into the CSS files. Um, so if you're gonna be here on Thursday, then you'll, we'll definitely go through all of that. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna pull that up today because we'll be covering it on Thursday and it might be a little bit confusing, but yeah. And specifically, it would be the default CSS uh, file, which we haven't we haven't um, talked about yet. Okay, great, thanks, Emma. Okay, so back to the emoji question. So now we've downloaded the emoji package, and so the way you would do it is, if I want to put one, say, let me I'll just make a new slide. Slide. I want to center things. And I want it in the middle and I want to insert an emoji. Then I would just do backtick R emoji package. Um, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a weird spelling. So it's the emoji package, but it's email colon colon. And then you would write JI and then you would write, for example, ta da. That's one of my favorite things. And Let's see, okay, 
Thanks, Lori, for providing that. Yeah, fun, awesome. And then, and then there's also the icon package. The icon package is the one we talked about today, and I forgot to include download information for that as well. Uh, so let me just pull that up real quick. I'm just navigating here. Okay, I'll copy and paste that in there. And we can also do that over here. Okay, but yeah, we did save the emoji. So let's see if it pops up in our preview window over here. Yep, so there it is. On the new slide, centered and in the middle. Oh, okay. 10 minutes of the year turn are up. So we can go ahead and move forward. Windows around. Okay. All right. So we've talked about a lot of things, but you might be wondering what about our content? How are we going to show code or plots that we make in our slides? So we're going to cover two things. We're going to cover tables and plots. So for tables, you have a few options. So one, it could just be the direct output from your code chunk. So on this slide, it's just a showing the lines of code and then followed by the, the table. And want to make a note, there's a little footnote here that we're using the NHSR data sets package for this, which is why it shows up in the code chunk right here. And the specific data set we're looking at is the LOS model one. And the other option, or another option, I should say, is to look at it as HTML. And so you would add on um, the cable function from Knitter and you have to specify that the format needs to be HTML for it to render this way, but it looks a little bit nicer, more readable. And then another option still is to use data table. So the sharing then plays well with the data table package. So this is just an example of the same data set. Whoops, same data set. Um, but now it's it's rendered as a data table instead of a, a standard HTML table. And so these are nice if you haven't seen them before, because you can um, you can interact with them. So if I wanted to, let's say maybe you can search for organization trust three, and then it would narrow down to um, that specific thing that I entered in the in the search box. Um, within whatever I'm showing. So it's only showing me one entry right now because I've, I've already narrowed down the data set to head, which includes just the top, uh, so the top six rows. But they can be really nice to interact with. And if you have factors in your data table, um, then you can, you can also often filter with factors with little drop down menus. So those are pretty fun to, to play with and they work nicely with this package with Sharon again. Another option still is GT table. So GT stands for grammar of tables and it's a package that was developed um, by Rich and I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name but it's spelled I-A-N-N-O-N-E. And um, he developed this package to help apply the same principles of ggplot which is grammar of graphics to table making. And so I added a footnote here, which is getting um, mixed up with the table, but there's a, there is a GT package workshop in this conference this week that's happening tomorrow. And I would highly recommend if you're interested in figuring out how to apply that grammar of tables uh, philosophy to your table making, then I would encourage you to check it out. Um, that being said, you can include GT tables and Sharingan as well. And so this is just a very simple example. There's not really much going on. But if you if you are familiar with GT and you end up using some of the cool functions included in that package, then you can organize the content in your table in interesting ways to make it even more readable, which is great. And okay, moving on to plots. So oftentimes I like to include code on one side of my slide and then the resulting plot in the other, for example, which is what I'm showing here. 
And in this example, we're using, we're still using the same data set as before. But now we're also using the package NHSR theme, which, um, so not only does the package have, uh, the goal is for it to have templates that the NHSR community can use to create the documents that they want, but it also has built-in color palettes according to the NHS um, identity guidelines. And so you can specify which palette you would like and then know that it already complies with, with the identity guidelines. And so that's what I've used here. So here I'm just plotting age and then uh, organization on the left-hand side here on the y-axis. And then I'm also color coding based on organization. So I've got the fill mapped to organization. And so I've specified that I wanted the colors to come from the NHSR theme package. And then there's a specific scale fill function that you can use. And then you can specify which of the different uh, palettes. I believe there's four different palettes and I can show that to you as well. Um, that can be used with your plots. And so that's what we're seeing here. And move forward, can I skip something? No, okay. So I've included here, I've embedded some slides from Allison Hill. She gave a, a workshop called Teaching and Production where she goes through, the whole slide deck is really great. I've just zoomed in on the specific part, but you can click through um, on your own. But she provides a lot of really great tips for when you want to do, when you want to show code and your plot. So depending on what your, your intended audience is, you may be interested in showing code or you may be interested in, um, in not showing it, so just showing the output. But if you are interested in showing the code, showing the code either to, um, you know, to your peers or, or coworkers, or if you want to teach and you want to be able to use it as a teaching tool, um, there's a lot of really, really great advice in the slide deck. So I've just embedded it here. And so one of the things that Allison talks about and does a really nice job describing is, you know, one way you could do it in, in sharing in is to just um, to duplicate your chunks and have the first chunk have all the code that you would like to produce the output. And then you would specify in your code chunk that you wanted, um, that you didn't want to show the, you didn't want to produce the output for that chunk and then you would make another chunk and then have that produce the code or the produce the plot. Um, but she advocates to not repeat yourself, which I think is great. And so there's, there's some tricks that you can use um, when you're specifying code chunk options so that you can just write the chunk once and then refer to it when you're ready for it to, to actually show up um, in your slide. So we can practice some of that. But that's basically what this slide is describing. So if you wanted your code to show up first, so like on the left, for example, and then you wanted the plot to show up later, say like on the right, then you would give the code chunk a name. So in this example, it's plot last. And then you would specify in your chunk options that you wanted to hide. So fig show equals hide um, so that it wouldn't show the output right away. And then afterwards, when you're ready to show it, then you would use this ref label code chunk option and set it equal to the name that you gave the code chunk that has all your, uh, all the code that's gonna be used to generate the output. And then you just hide uh, that little chunk using echo equals false. And then, there's a, and then there's the other approach where if you say wanted to put the plot first and the code second, then you would follow a bit of a different, um, different step. So the first chunk that you would put into your R markdown file, we would also have a name. So in this case, it's plot first, and then you would you would hide that one, and you would just let it um, let let it show the output. And then after that, in the next chunk, then you would refer to that first one, but hide the output. So depending on what you want to do, there are a few tricks that you can use for that. Uh, so I think she shows examples here of coding first, showing the code first and then plotting second. So what you type would look something like this. If you wanted to use, um, if you wanted to be like left-hand side, right-hand side, then you would use the pull left class and the pull right class. And you would put your code chunk within pull left for the left-hand side. And again, your code would go in the middle 
and you would specify that you wanted to hide that plot because you're not ready to show it yet. And then once you get to your pull right class, the filler for that would just be a reference to the other plot where you already included your code. You would refer to it by the chunk name and then you would set echo equals false so that the, the chunk um, doesn't get printed, but just the output does. And so you end up seeing something like this where you have the code on the left and then the plot on the right hand side. And then the other option is if you wanted to show the plot first on the left hand side, for example, and then show the code second. And so you would, you would write up your code chunk, you would put it inside of a pull left class as a filler, and then you would just say echo falls so that the, the code doesn't show for that chunk, but it still produces the output because you're ready to, to show it in that spot. And then for the right hand side, you would use pull right. And then for the filler, you would again refer to that by name to that other code chunk. And then this time you would, you would hide the output because you've already shown it before and now you want to hide it, but you want to show the actual um, filler, the actual code stuff. And so you would end up seeing something like this, where you have your plot on the left and then the code that produced it on the right hand side. Okay, and then with that, I think we can have another your turn. Um, actually, I'm wondering, maybe we'll, we'll do some more demoing stuff first before we we hit the next year turn. Because there were some questions I think that had come up. And so I think it'd be nice to address those. Um, and I can just show you. Let me pull up the chat box so I can have that ready to go. Okay, yeah. So one of the questions that Lori helped me post in here was how many of you share code in slides? So if you wouldn't mind, um, giving a smiley face. If you are somebody who likes to share code in slides, that'd be great to know. And then I can also show some other, some other things that you can do to help, help with that. Okay, so at least a few people. And then there's a couple of sad faces too. Yeah, we don't always like to show code in slides. That's totally fine. Makes total sense. And sometimes we might wanna show the code, but maybe other people don't wanna look at it. So it just, it all depends. Yeah, Jonathan says, especially if slides aren't for analysts. Yep. Oh, I don't have anyone to share with. <laughs> yeah, well, you can share with the NHSR community. <laughs> I'm sure they'd be more than happy. Yeah, there we go, Zoe says yes. Okay. Um, okay, Lori, could you remind me what it was we were chatting about? Oh, the incremental the incremental slides. Yeah. So one of the things that I, I did not mention in the presentation was that um, incremental slides really just work when, when you're not really formatting or arranging your content too much on a slide. So for example, um, you're not able currently to do, to show maybe your code on the left and then do an incremental slide so that the plot shows up afterwards. You can't use, I mean, basically you can't use the incremental slide feature within any kind of class. It just has to be within the broader slide. So I'll show you some examples. So here I made a new slide by typing three dashes. And uh, yeah, so I'll make another one and I'll say, what I wanna do. Maybe I'll just say first heading, and then I'll make an incremental slide by separating it with two dashes. And then I'll make another heading. And then I'll save. Oh, wait, I need to finish doing this first. Oh, yeah, I was downloading the icon package. Okay, let's hold on just a little bit. I guess while that's going, I'm just gonna start making the other slide so that we can compare and contrast. So if I wanted to pull things to the left, and let's say I wanted to say some content on the left, whoops. 
some content on the left in my pull left class, and then I'm going to use a pull right class to show some content on the right. Um, you could still use incremental slides here. Okay, so now that I've downloaded this stuff, I'm going to go ahead and Yeah, let me do this. I'm gonna do sharing in infinite reader again because I think it got a little bit confused when I was downloading packages. Okay, so now we've generated some new content on the right hand side. Let me move my boxes around here. Okay, so in this example, I'll just make it a little bit bigger. I'll, yeah, and I'll save. Okay, so in this example, I have some content on the left and I don't want the content on the right to show up yet. So I use that incremental um, slide feature with the two dashes and then I could show the content on the right hand side. Um, but if, yeah, here, let me try another slide. If we wanted to do that within um, any kind of class. So like if we wanted to do that within pull left, for example, then it would not let us. And it won't work. It's a little bit sad. Okay, so I'm still within my pull left class. I'm just making it pretty spacious with a lot of filler. And so if I wanted to try to add an incremental slide here, and then some more content there. It would, I don't think it would play nicely. Yeah, so this is how it looks. It looks a little bit sad. So it just shows, it just prints the two dashes like it was part of the content. It doesn't um, enable you to use the incremental slide feature. So that's something to definitely be aware of. And, but you know, otherwise, you can show, you can use classes within classes sometimes. And so if I wanted to do, for example, maybe I want to create four columns, a uh, relatively simple way to do that without having to make any CSS classes would be to nest a pull left and a pull right within a pull left and a pull right. So there's a little bit of pulling inception happening. So if I wanted this to have to be like my first column of things, and then maybe I wanted to have second column of things, you could do that. And then likewise, you could do the same on the right, where I have a pull right class that I made a lot of space for. Make a pull left, and then I'll make a pull right. And then in what would be, I guess now, the third column would kind of look like this. So there are some things that are fun that you can do when you can nest classes. It doesn't, you can't necessarily nest all of them together. Um, some classes take precedent over others, but it's definitely worth exploring and playing around with to see what you can get away with. Uh, let's see, what else we have in this chat box? Let me put in after pause too. Yes, Jonathan, you can, and Lori answered that. Um, yeah, there are some options for interactive plots. So Leaflet is definitely one that's supported by Sharingan, and the DT tables are supported by Sharingan. And I wanna say there might be something else. I, I think at the for the time being, you cannot, uh, embed shiny apps within Sharingan, which I know is a bummer for some of you. Um, the Sharingan app has those sorts of things with the interactivity are considered widgets and they're kind of still in development. And so there's no, there's no like guarantee that's going to work every time, um, but it might get better later on. 
and uh, and then maybe someday down the road you'll be able to embed a shiny shiny app in there. What do we got here about DIY graphs and Plotly? Are they supported? I think I think Plotly might be. I'm not sure. I don't. I'm not familiar with DIY graphs. But let's take a look. Let's do some some googling. It might be more effective if I went to the sharing and GitHub repo and look through some issues. This does not look super promising. Oh. Now I'm just curious. Oh, charting time series in R. Cool. Well, you know, I would say try it out. Um, but I, I don't believe that that's in the documentation for Sharingan, so I don't think it's supported. But I can't imagine there would be an issue with Plotly. But let's let's take a quick look through the issues and see what we can find. Just real quick. See if anybody's talked about Plotly already. Okay, yeah. So somebody says they filed an issue about Plotly, uh, but it, it looks like they already used it and they were just asking about something in particular. Yep. So that's great to know. Very cool. Okay, so I guess the lesson here is if you look through issues for sharing and you're likely to find something related to what you're asking about. Um, I, I do quite often. Okay, let's go back to the cloud project. What else we got? No, thanks, I said that looking. Oh yeah, <laughs> issues are great. Um, okay, Lori, was there anything else that you and I touched base on? for demos that I can maybe run through. Okay. I think the only other thing would be, um, you could show maybe the code highlighting real quick. Yes, thank you. That's what I was thinking of. All right. So yeah, so Lori had brought up a great point, which is, you know, even if you're not always showing code or you get the chance to show code, um, you can still, you can still, practice using code highlighting, um, which I, I think I might have used in my slide deck, but I can show you what that looks like. Um, okay, so here I'm creating a new slide with a chunk. And let's see, maybe I'll use data set. This is that package I've been mentioning with the different data sets for practicing. So I'm just gonna select the one we've been looking at and then um, let's just show, just show the head, but maybe I want to show my audience that I want to talk about this particular line of code. And so you can add a hashtag and then less than, less than, and then it should show up highlighted on the other side. So let's, whoops. Try that. Okay, so if you see on the right hand side, I had to specify echo equals true in my left hand side for that chunk to also show so that it wouldn't just show the output, um, which is what I did here. But anyways, you'll see that the second line corresponding to that head function shows up highlighted with like a light gray color when you use the two, the hashtag followed by the two less than signs. Um, so that can really come in handy. And we'll go over on Thursday, something about the sharing an extra package that can also be useful for specifying certain lines of code within your slides. Um, okay, so I think we can probably pause here and move into the your turn. Coming up next. Yeah, which is just another, how are we doing on time? Okay, actually, because we're almost out of time, um, we're gonna, we're gonna, skip this your turn you can practice on your own time but i want to have some time where we can practice deploying the slides to github uh, which i think is an important important thing to be able to do so um okay good question i'll i'll make sure and share share that that link for installing nhsr theme um it might also be it might also be in the r markdown file at the very very top but i'll, I'll definitely get back to you about that 
Um, so if we're in our cloud project and we want to, or let's just back up a little bit. Say we're not, we're not even in our cloud project. We're working wherever we're working. And we want to be able to deploy to GitHub. The first thing that I would recommend doing, or the, the recommended approach is to create a repo first. And so if everybody wants to go ahead, whoever wants to follow along can do this. I'm just gonna try it out with my own account. Um, so I'm gonna go to my GitHub and move my windows over. Okay, and then I'm gonna say, uh, where am I? Here we go, new repository. And then I'm gonna call it, um, my slides. And then I'm not going to give a description right now. Uh, I do want to make it public so that the HTML link that you're deploying to the GitHub can be viewed. Um, yeah, can be viewed. And yeah, I think that's all I'll do for now. So I'll create this repository. And this is a screen that I get, which has a little copy paste button where I can copy the link to that repo. So this step is not something I've done in RStudio Cloud, but we're going to try it and we're just going to see how it goes. Um, so from here, what I would do is, hold on, give me a second. Let's look through, let's pull up Happy Git with R. This is always my go-to when I can't remember the steps. Okay, so this is a book uh, written by Jenny Bryan, and it's a really wonderful guide to using Git with R in R Studio. So I, I would definitely recommend checking it out. So we're going to scroll down to the section that talks about connecting to GitHub. Uh, I think, I think, I think, I think we can start with an existing project, which we have, we already have an R project in our um, R Studio Cloud, which is that project file in our directory. And we have a repo, but we didn't make the repo along with the project. And so I think we're gonna wanna use this option, which is so you have an, an existing project, but you made your GitHub repo last. So let's follow these steps and see. Okay, um, let's see, we already made a repo. Okay, so what I'm looking at here that has reminded me is this section here that talks about, let me make this bigger. This section here says you can go to tools, project options, and then you can specify your repo in there. So let's try that in our cloud project. So I think we can come, is it, is it tools? Yeah, tools, version control, maybe project setup. And then it says under project options, we're looking at version control. Now it won't let me edit this, I think because I'm already logged in because it's already associated with my project for to create this material for today. Um, could somebody, Lori, could you tell me what you see on this in this um, pop-up window? Yeah, let me check. Hang on a sec. Okay. And if we can't figure out how to do it here, then I think I might be able to. I'll be able to, to write up um, like a step-by-step -step on how to do it and share it with everybody afterwards um, if we aren't able to get through it by the time the workshop's over. Or if anybody else is following along and they'd like to tell me what they see on this screen, that's totally cool too. Sylvia, I was actually looking up the um, NHSI theme. Can you walk me through where to find the window again? Mm -hmm. Yep, you want to go to Tools, mm -hmm. the top menu, and then I think you go down to where it says Version Control. Mm -hmm. And then um, I 
think that's might have been what opened up this window. Okay. It takes me, um, if I go to version control, uh, do you think it was project options? I think it's project options. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And then down to git slash SVN. It's just um, reading the options now. I think the cloud's just a little slow. Mm. Still reading. Sounds good, thank you. And also, I wonder if I could just um, just demo it from my Josie, Josie said that she sees the same, same as you. Okay, then let's not, let's not try to do that with cloud project and I'll just demo it using my computer or my, my local files. And uh, so that that's at least in the video, if people watch it later. Okay, and Leonardo also see the same. Okay, we're doing it, we're moving over. Um, let me find my thing here. Okay, let me just, I guess we want to close this project. Okay, let me make this a little bit bigger. Okay. So let me think about this. Okay, so we're going to create a project first. Which is the step that we made in our studio cloud. Okay, so we're not gonna do a GitHub right now. We're just gonna make a new project and we're just gonna put it here. I'm just gonna call it my slides. I'm not gonna create a repo. Yeah, and I'm still just going through the steps of getting to where everybody is right now in our studio cloud. So please bear with me. Okay. Um, now I'm just gonna go through the steps of creating a new uh, template file, just like we did at the beginning of the workshop. From template, NHSR, my slides. Okay. There we go. Okay, so now we see, this looks very similar now to your cloud project. There's a folder that has the different folders that we already talked about. There's my R markdown file, also open on the left. Um, so let's say I'm done and I wanna connect this and deploy to GitHub. And, um, and I went and made my repo, but now I need to connect them. Then what I would wanna do is go to tools, version control, project setup. Okay, and then here it shows us that we're not using anything yet which is true for me, but not true for everybody in the R Studio Cloud project. And so I'm gonna say, use Git. And then it asks me, do you wanna initialize a new Git repository for this project? I say, yes. Okay, I'll need to restart. Yep, let's do it. Okay, now we have get initialized, but it's not connected to the repository yet. So we're gonna go back to happy git with R and continue following the steps that we started earlier. Okay, so here we go in the shell in projects directory do git init. So this initializes a repository. So I'm gonna come back to my IDE. I'm gonna open up, oh, console's already open. So that sounds good. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna to go to the terminal and I'm already in my project because I've been working in my project this whole time, which is the preferred way um, to work in R is to work with projects. I'm already in there in the right directory. I'm gonna write git init. And it says reinitializing existing git repository. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, Let's see, is it already? 
Mm. And if you use our series, blah, 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 blah. Okay, and then our studio should now have a Git pane. So let's double check and see if we can see that. Yeah, so now we see that here and there's a bunch of files in there. And so what I need to do is I need to stage them. So like indicate that I want to include them. And so I'm just gonna do that for all of them. And I'm gonna say git add and then the dot specifies to add all of those files to the staging area. And then the next step would be, and if I refresh this, then all those things will have a little check box, box next to them. And so the next step would be to, um, to commit these files and I can do that with the commit command. So git commit and then I'll do a dash M to indicate that I'm gonna write a message and I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna say initialize repository written like that. And so then it tells us, okay, initialize repository, created all these things. And then I'm gonna say, I'm gonna push it. Um, so in this particular situation, I guess I'm still a little bit confused about how we're gonna connect it to the repo that we made already. Okay, here we go. Um, so it says here, there's no destination. So it doesn't know where to push these files. Either specify the URL from the command line or configure a remote repository. So let's go back to happy git with R and see what's recommended there. Here's what we did already, stage and commit. And then here we go, make and connect a GitHub repo. Um, I'm not gonna use this approach. I believe that's the more straightforward approach, um, but I'm used to doing it the other way. So we're gonna try it the other way, which is a little bit further down. Okay, so we already made a new repo. So let's scroll down, clone the local repo to the GitHub repo. In our studio, we got two boxes in the shell, which is the way that I am doing it already. I would use this line, but I would replace the link that Jenny's provided with my own link from my repo that I already made, which is over here. So I can copy that and then I can, actually, let me copy this first and then I'll copy that again. So let me put this in here. Except we're gonna delete the link from the book and I'm gonna recopy the link from my repo. Okay. And the next step is to push and cement the tracking relationship between your local branch and the master branch on GitHub. Let's see here. So I'm gonna copy, whoops, I didn't talk through that. I'm copying this line of code here and I'm just gonna put that in the terminal next. Okay, so it's working and it says here that the branch master is set up to track the remote branch, um, which is the one on GitHub. So I think we are all set. We don't have anything in this Git box because we already took care of pushing it and everything. So I think I can just go back to my repo and reload. And my files are in there. Um, now I think what I forgot to do was to actually make some slides that generates the HTML. So let me just do that real quick. I'm gonna open up my R markdown. I'm gonna generate my slides. Looking fast here, I wanna be respectful of the workshop time. Um, okay, so now that I've made some slides, now I have a new HTML file, which I haven't pushed to GitHub yet. So I'm gonna do some of the steps that we already took before, which is to add the files that have been changed to um, commit them with the message. I'm just gonna write commit. And then we're gonna push It's still working. Okay, so that's done. So let's refresh and make sure, yep, nothing's in there. So it got pushed. 
Let's refresh again. Okay, and there we go. Now we see the HTML uh, file. So the next thing that we do is we go to settings for that repo that we made where our files are located. And we go, let me move my windows around. Then we go down to where it says GitHub pages. And oh my goodness, my Zoom boxes are everywhere. Okay. So it says GitHub pages is currently disabled. So we're gonna enable it and we're gonna use the master branch, which is the one that we've been working with. And we're gonna click save. And so now if we scroll down, we should see that it's enabled. Yeah, so it says your site is ready to be published at this site. So this looks very similar to my repo link, except things, look up, things are moved around just a little bit. So now I have a link for github.io using my GitHub username. And so that's how we're gonna specify where our HTML file is. So I should be able to copy that and put it up here. And then I believe what I call it, my slides.html. No, I don't think I typed that in right. Let's see. It should be the path to the file. So let's try going that way. So we'll go back to the repo. Ah, there's a my slides folder. So let's just navigate to the file that we made that we know has our slides in it. And what shows up here is the path to the file. And so if we wanted to look at that path, um, I'm just gonna manually adjust it to what corresponds to the GitHub uh, pages link. And so I'm just gonna move things around because I know where they go. So I'm gonna put my username at the front of it. I'm gonna make it github.io instead of github.com. I've already moved my username, so I'm gonna delete that. And then I can also delete this blob master stuff because at the end of the day, you just need to specify where your, where your files are. So it's, a, it's in a more intuitive way when it's written out this way which is easier to remember. Um, and so we're gonna go into the My Slides repo into the My Slides folder, and then we should be able to view our My Slides HTML. Okay, there they are. So now that we have them, I can share this link with other people. Um, so this is what I do if I'm presenting in my lab, for example, I'll do, I'll go through all these steps and then I'll share this link and then when, I'm, when I don't want them to be publicly available anymore, then I can just go back to the settings for my repo and I can just disable GitHub pages and uh, that's all there is to it. So I think I can move stuff around again. Uh, let's see. I think we just go ahead and say none and then say- yeah. Will that work with both private and public repos? So if people wanted to keep um, kind of different bits of the code or other things private? Mm -hmm. Good question. So this option only works if you're public, if your repo is public. Um, yes, deploying to GitHub pages can only be done for free when your entire repo is public. So if you, um, if you wanted to keep your whole repo private, then you would have to upgrade to a pro account, which I believe is about four or $5 a month. So the option that I recommend is to just, you know, keep your repo private. And then when you're ready to present, enable GitHub pages, share the link, do your presentation, and then disable GitHub pages um, and make your repo private again. Um, that's the approach that, that, I, that I usually take. Yeah, I think we are just at time. There's a couple minutes left. So if people have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box and I'll see if I can get to them. But I know I know that uh, NHSR needs to wrap up. So let me just go back to here. I'll end with this slide and then I'll, I'll cede my time. But thank you so much for your attention today. I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. 
Thank you, Sylvia. It was absolutely great. And uh, I'm pretty sure everyone is really excited that um, boring NHS uh, slides can be a bit more exciting and can be automated much better. I can see lots of thank yous coming. Uh, people really, really enjoyed it. Um, so just a quick note for everyone. Um, thank you to um, our participants as well. Um, and please, uh, can you share your feedback from, uh, with us? I'm just sharing the link to um, SurveyMonkey right now. And if you can follow it and let us know how we can make the workshops right, it would be really, really good because it's pretty much our first um, experience of making workshops virtually. And, uh, and yeah, nothing else from me. Once again, thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Laurie. Um, and thank you for, um, for your time and for experience. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I will see you all next time in next workshops. Bye. That was great. Thanks so much, everyone.